Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 12th year edition of the Sprouts Lecture Series. Uh, it's our pleasure to have a dear friend uh, and, and a fellow traveler, if I may say, uh, Priya Venkatesh. I think this lecture is sort of a, what can I say, a record of sorts, uh, one that a husband and wife, uh, you know, tend to follow each other on a lecture a series. So last month we had uh, Karthik and speak uh, about uh, biodiversity and this month we have Priya. I think it should have been the other way around, Priya. You could, uh, you can give me a better introduction. I know, I'm sure. I, <laughs> that's there. But yeah, uh, but I met, uh, I think, Karthik and you in that kind of order. So yeah. But but it didn't need to have been 12 years to wait for you to give this lecture. I'm sure of that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, welcome and uh, so happy to have you. Uh, the other thing uh, in terms of records, one can say is that uh, I think we're heading towards our 150th lecture. And this is a significant step towards that. Uh, so I, we're pretty excited. And this is our 30th year. So... Uh, that is another uh, high for us that, you know, we are having some very interesting uh, lectures uh, in the 30th year uh, of Sprouts. Priya has been a, a member of this journey for a very significantly long period of time. Uh, we've worked together. We've gone to the same college uh, together. So it, it's been it's been quite an interesting journey. We've done a lot of field trips also together uh and share similar passions uh, on so many things besides chai <laughs> I, I i yet remember you know while going to dandeli uh, waiting outside and having uh chai and uh theplas uh in in the cold winter so great to have you uh with us priya i would request ranjit my colleague to uh introduce you formally but uh welcome to our thank lecture you series. Pleasure is all mine. Yeah, hi friends. Uh, today is World Oceans Day, so happy World Ocean Day to all of you. Uh, Priya Venkatesh is the founder director of the National like Naturalist School, and uh, she is one of the few women to have crossed both the Arctic and the Antarctic circles. So today she will be sharing stories about her various adventurous explorations. You know, from the Arctic uh, Circle in the north to the Southern continent of Antarctica. Uh, she has been on a mission to educate people about the threats of climate change. And uh, like she says, she has a passion for learning and a deep interest in human behavior, technology adventure, and a love for natural world. Uh, she also teaches French in her uh, spare time and does decoupage in her spare time. That's what uh, I've been told. So I'll, I'll hand it over to her and looking forward to a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I want to I want to change one word, which is the last word of your intro, which is looking forward to this lecture. Anybody who's looking forward to this lecture, I think <laughs> I will go back home first. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I, I like the uh, I like the word, maybe a talk or a chat is, is probably more like what's going to happen today. I hope you guys don't mind that. Storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and um, while I know that you're all here to, to listen and also to see because you're on virtual screen, it would be really nice for me also to see all of you. And uh, I think it should be a fair exchange on the virtual screen as 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 immersive as, as it can get. So wherever you are, however you are, and whatever you're doing will be lovely to, uh, to see faces. And I don't mind waiting for a few seconds. So yeah, if anybody wants to quickly can switch on, on your their cameras, lipstick, yeah, comb their nice. hair. Huh. So, sometimes, Priya, they do have network issues. So do spare them for that <laughs> no but i'm still going to wait for a few seconds sure hey <laughs> see you see surprises i know, I know quite a that's surprise. why i want to see faces. I, I thought i i the name seemed familiar but now with the video see that's what happens you come <laughs> to know that there are old friends come on different. come on come on tejas honey jaydev we are in 300 people here 
<laughs> Come on, Tejas, be brave. Ah, they have, they have. Ah, Tejas is here. Can you, can you look at this t-shirt if you remember something? Yes, I do, of course. <laughs> no yeah, problem, Jayden, that's cool. That's cool, Jayden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ramnath, good to see All you. All right, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have one more person, Nana Nini, joining us. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, before I I share my screen, okay. So, um, thank you, Anand. Thank you, Ranjit. Like I said earlier, it is indeed more than a pleasure and honor to be here on this on this uh, screen. Uh, uh, also, <laughs> thanks, Anand, for reminding me <laughs> it has taken us 10 years or 12 years to do this talk and, uh, unintentional. Just goes to show that, you know, all, uh, all Sprouts volunteers are all busy in their lives doing good things. And... Uh, uh, we will find time to to connect with each other. And I think 30th year, uh, when you said 30th year, I was quite surprised. And then I realized, yes, it's it's been 21 years since I have moved from Bombay. And uh, yeah, lovely. So are, are all of us um, sprouts, first circle, second circle here, just for me to get a sense? Show of hands, emoticons, yes, no. Could you repeat that, please, Priya? I was I was asking, are all of us here first or second circle of sprouts? Like at some point in time in the 30-year journey, just so I get a sense of, uh, you some, know. Some are completely much... new joinees. Yeah. Okay. okay. Like Darshana, I think, uh, Shikha, etc. Ah, Darshana says first time. Yes, Jaydev. Okay. All right. Take it. Lovely. Nice, Shikha. Nice of you to have joined. Okay. So, um. So the next uh, whatever minutes, 90 minutes or so, you are stuck with me and I'm stuck with you. So let's make this interesting. Um, I'm going to share with you a small piece of, of my life and I'm hoping that it will seem like an adventure to you. It was to me. Um, and the adventure continues. So I want to take you back about what? To 1998. I don't know where each one of you was. I was in Bombay. 98, uh, 99, I was in college in Bombay, um, studying away from home in New Bombay. How many of you from Bombay here? Yeah, emoticons will also work for people who don't have their cameras on. Yeah, so um, I'm going to take you back a little bit in time and um, One moment, let's get the technology right. Okay, yeah. And um, so I guess most of you from Bombay and Anand, I'm now off the, the chat window. So I, I won't see if there's anything just, uh, you know, call. This place uh, is where I was born. This place is where, uh, you know, I, I grew, I did everything good, bad, ugly. and. Uh, it's 21 years now that I have moved to a different city, which is Bangalore. And um, I I still call myself a Bombayite. So you know what a, what a hardcore, uh, you know, like they say, you can take a person from Bombay, but can't take Bombay out of a person. So I'm right there so that you get a character sketch about me apart from, you know, you can ignore all that, <laughs> all that you heard, but that's, that's the real me. Now, I'm also going to pick up a piece of my life, which I consider or I'm consciously, uh, uh, you know, the adventurous uh, piece of my life as I can see it. And I'm sure that, you know, it is the same for all of you. And uh, uh, it, it's all a journey. My first tryst with uh, adventure itself started in, in Bombay um, in the year, I think, 98, 99. Yeah, I was in my second year, uh, final year rather, whatever, second year, final year of my management studies. And I was due for my final vivas in about two weeks time. And there came this opportunity from this organization called Shikhar Outward Bound Institute. And uh, I heard that they were taking people on a trek to the Himalayas. And wow, I had never seen the snow before in my life. And it had been on my bucket list and Thankfully, I saw it. I saw it when I did. So, I remember going to my uh, my dean. 
you know, after that final written exam, and there was, there was, I think, a week before the final vivas, and I had to leave on the trek the very next morning, which means I would definitely miss the viva, or I miss the trek and I do the viva, but you know where my loyalties lay, you know. So I went, met my dean at 9 p.m., I remember, and um, I waited and waited and waited outside his cabin, and then I went into his cabin, and again, I waited and waited and waited, and I told him, sir, um, can you please do something? Mujhe trek par jana hai, sir. Snow nahi dekha hai, sir. Life mein. First time chance mil raha hai, sir. And he said, uh, okay, go. You're an adult. You've done your management studies. You know what is, you know, consequence and, you know, action and consequence. So you take your action and you deal with your consequence. And, you know, like this, puchne mein kya hai? Toh maine chhoda hi nahi. Mein puchti rahi. I begged and pleaded and then I waited and waited. I think it was almost 9.45 and uh, I said, no, but sir, I want to give my viva, but I also want to go for the trek. So please understand, you know, I mean, I'm sure we've all, we've all tried all forms of, uh, I, I was not very good at negotiation, though I had finished my two years of MBA. Please don't judge my college for that. It's just me. Um, but somehow he took pity on me. And at 9.45, I remember because I looked at the watch the moment he said that. He said, ja, ja, Priya, ja. <laughs> very dramatic, okay. And of course, like, you know, everybody who's, who's listening to me, I was like, ja, Simran, ja, my God, but this is scary because I don't know if he's telling me, you know, just because he's done with me or he's really okay. And I'm like, sir, are you sure I can go? Are you sure? Like, you know, my viva, something you will do about it. He was like, yeah, go. And that was my first conscious, uh, you know, adventure and negotiation with life to go on an adventure. I was ready to miss my my two years of hard work and finally at Viva. And I think after that, there was absolutely no looking back. Um, that, that trek and a lot of other things also that I'm going to share with you changed my life. And the story is about me um, moving from Bombay, starting with Shikhar to landing in Bangalore. Yeah, the, the pensioner's paradise, the garden city, maybe all these names are passe, but, but we still like to hold on to it. And uh, where I am today with the naturalist school. Yeah. So like I said, yes, my journey began with that trek. I mean, that trek was, was like an initiation. Many of you might have been initiated. And that, that is what it was. I'll come back to it a little later in my story. But really what um, also pushed around the same time was this. Yeah. How many of you are familiar with Sanjay Gandhi National Park and this site? Um, I'm going to try and move to, uh, what is that, gallery view, uh, Anand, just, just give me a few seconds, because I can't do you this. Can do a grid view. You can do a grid view if you want. Or a, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm going to do. I'm just trying to see where those settings are. I'm used to Google. Sorry, guys. On the right hand side top, there'll be something called view. Okay, never mind next to your image or view options never mind yeah oh got it got it got it sorry sorry yeah. sorry for this ignorant you see how much work i did online through covid quite a waste i have been, yeah i prefer okay, so the real world there. to this okay there yeah so um so what happened was how many of you said you you have this this is a familiar site how many of you have been to uh, sgnp burivli national park Okay, so Tejas and all, y'all are not from here? Tejas, Jaydev, Tikha. So Tejas said he's worked there in Bombay for a few years. Okay, so for all those of you whose I'll, thumbs I'll, are I'll, not I'll, up or whose hands are not up, please do visit Bombay. Um, please do visit the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. It's the only national park within city premises in Asia, as I have been told by Anand. Is that right? Yes. Yes, long time ago, see? Memory is good. Okay. And this, this for me was a familiar sight when I did my volunteer training program with WWF in 1998. Yeah, again, another adventure. And I think I suddenly, when I was putting this PPT together, I, I realized that my life has just been an, a, a series of adventures, you know. Um, and I think it just makes it uh, easier uh, that way, for me at least. So we were sitting at home, it was it was a holiday and my sister flipped the newspaper and she said, hey, there is something written here, you know, which says volunteer training program, it says Sanjay Gandhi National Park and it was close to home. 
एंड वी सेड ओके थ्री डेज हॉलीडे चलो क्या करना है एंड यू नो नो इंस्टाग्राम नो फेसबुक सो वी कूडेंट चेक एनी थिंग वी हैड नो क्लू वॉट डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ आर्स वॉट वॉट बट वी न्यू नेशनल पार्क बिकॉज वी हैड गॉन ऑन स्कूल पिकनिक्स तो बट देर वॉज अ फोन नंबर गिवन थैंकफुलीस इन रेगुलर लैंड लाइन्स so we called the the number and we dialed and they said sure you can register i think it was a free free three day program if i'm not mistaken and so we signed up and little did we know what we were both signing up for um it was uh, it it completely you know kind of put us on a trajectory and an orbit that we would have never never known so thanks to that little ad and thanks to times of india thanks to wwf for put an ad in times of india <laughs> yeah so we both of us were off for 3 days right in the heart of um uh, sanjay gandhi national park we had a 3 day uh, fantastic 3 days and 3 nights actually two nights uh, training camp and um, um we won't we won't have this mutual admiration club continuing but i must tell you that uh, one more thing and or person that changed my life was anand pendharkar he's right here so uh, thank you anand um that's where i met anand he was one of the resource people of wwf and um, with wwf and i think sometimes that's all it takes it just takes a meeting with somebody a, a conversation an engagement with somebody to put you on a track or on a highway sometimes that you'd never known existed for yourself um three days later we were walking out as we were walking out of the gate and i remember um, you know the the national park is on the highway literally you know so as we walk out of the main gate uh, there is that fata you know which we have to cross it's just like a barricade and as i was nearing the barricade i suddenly heard it just seemed like these sounds came out of nowhere you know they were honking and there was like truck sounds and car honks and i don't know how many sounds there were but it just made me instantly like you know with a reflex i i remember closing my ears and i wanted to just run back into national park and the first time i realized that that's the noise i had been living with for all those years and it suddenly seemed so alien and so foreign um very 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 reluctantly walked to the barricade opened the barricade went to the main road and actually came back to the real world yeah came back home came to the real world but well it was a good trigger it was a good i would think wake up call because after that i don't remember a single saturday or a single sunday that i have not been in the national park for as long as i was in bombay so that's that's how this journey started partly in the mountains partly in the forest and both of them around the same time in life and um one moment yeah and i yeah. think coincidentally there was also bharat bhai who was A part of that work. Oh yes, yes, yes. Where is Bharat Bhai? He is, I think, there in the audience. Yeah, so he will vouch. I think he dropped out. He couldn't. Uh, okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So it was a it was a lovely bunch of people, and we are still, uh, uh, you know, in touch with quite a few people from there. And like Anand said, Bharat Bhai is here, and you can do your your math. Ninety eight, nineteen. Yeah. To twenty twenty four, we are all still here. And uh, yes, numerous. a uh, walks trails uh, treks into national park with children adolescents adults senior citizens uh, nature walks themed walks tree walks um you name it and uh, you know we did it actually uh, it was the first time that you know the heart felt free the the body felt free and uh, uh, i think you have to experience freedom to really know what freedom is and um, it's also addictive so i will warn some of you who are not there yet be careful uh, before you get into this it's it's quite an addictive bug <laughs> yeah so um so that was uh, that's that's where this whole thing started and while anand and i continue to be in touch and like anand said work together we had one nice safar nama which began and sprouts has many avatars today as you all know it 30 years old but at that point in time around 99 2000 um Anand and I were part of a small uh, reinitiation of sprouts that we had, and um, we actually, you know, did a lot of nature camps together. We kind of rechristened sprouts together. So I am part of one of the the organizing 
organizations um, uh, of, of Sprout. So founder, director uh, at some point in time and definitely a member, lifelong member. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was also the, the program where we initiated this was also where we met Ram, if I'm not mistaken. Ram, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it's been a very, very um, heartwarming, uh, you know, journey uh, in Bombay ever since we began. And um, that was 2002. 2002 by the time. Yeah. By the time Sprouts reinitiated, uh, that was 2002. Thanks, Anand. Yeah, and parallelly, my life also, um, you know, was on this track with Shikhar Outward Bound Institute. While Shikhar, while I went on the trek with Shikhar, that was my first introduction. Uh, Shikhar actually was a corporate training organization. They did outbound training. Some of you may be familiar with this. And um, once a year, they took children on a trek. And children nine years and nine to 90 was, was the age that I have traveled with. And uh, the one person I must totally acknowledge here uh, in absentia is uh, Mr. Mahesh Chaturvedi. I'm sure some of you here, yes, uh, know, know this stalwart. He's no more with us. Uh, but he is one of the few people who brought adventure into not only my life, but also uh, lives of many others around, around me, but also taught us how to live adventure responsibly. How to, you know, um, yeah, and Spider-Man, right? I know a lot of uh, Spider-Man fans out there with great power comes great responsibility. So we used to lead treks and he would um, instill, you know, and encourage us to lead uh, treks to the Himalayas with the children and also make sure that we learned what responsibility was, what accountability was in his own in his own style and in his own ways. And um, I think to this day, a lot of us in India, at least, and also in the UK, because he that's where he worked also and studied and worked there. Oh, it oh a lot of our own core, um, you know, uh, I would say beliefs uh, to Mahesh. Um, so while my life was running parallel with two adventures, one was with, with WWF, with nature, and the other with, with Shikhar in outbound training. So since I had finished my, my management, Mahesh said, look, you have studied all these things in books. You know, hum dikhate hai ki real life mein kya hoti hai cheez. And that's how I, uh, I, I started working with Shikhar as an outbound facilitator. Of course, the adventure never stopped. He pushed me in initially as a participant, and it was quite quite an experience because I was 20 something and I was there with you know people who were like in their late 40s early 50s and and three and a half days of full ragada and guess where uh, where the outbound happened now that that is something I don't know who I should thank for um, this happened in Borivli National Park so my life on weekends was spent with either um, WWF doing walks or with Shikhar doing the training programs and um, slowly, while as I worked with, uh, continued to work with the WWF on uh, one occasion, I had the opportunity to uh, volunteer uh, to take a, a group of senior citizens to Karnataka, to this national park, to this tiger reserve called Bandipur. Yeah, and um, again, um, Bandipur a tiger reserve. Um, how many of you have visited this place or, or any other tiger reserve in the country? Just a, an emoticon will help me because that's that's what I can see. Just a, just a thumbs up, whatever. Okay. So Bandipur, you will all know, like I already told you, it's a, it was a tiger reserve. So obviously, uh, part of people go there, visitors go there to see what? Tigers? So this was the first time I entered a forest forest. I mean, apart from Borivli National Park. So I think it was the first day we were there with all the participants and I was a volunteer, so I was just escorting people. Um, we went in, we were in a canter, I remember. We saw a tiger and, you know, the tiger was sitting there for a long time and then we also saw a spotted deer and we all waited. There was some little bit of screaming and then people said, shh, shh and everybody was quiet. And I don't know whether it was because of our screaming or what, but I remember the deer went away and this tiger sat there and then got up and then, you know, slowly moved. And uh, and that was that. So we finished the, the safari and we came back. And as soon as we came out of the canter, 
there was so much of furor celebration i didn't even know it was celebration initially because i was screaming and screeching and everybody was like going crazy and i didn't know quite what that was and then i slowly learned that you know these people had all been visiting national parks tiger reserves for all their life and then today they had had the sighting of this enigmatic uh, you know cat called the tiger and little surprise also good good learning for me because i didn't know that i thought if you went into a forest you would see your tiger and whatever else was present there so this was a small um, a, a, a small adventure for a lot of lot of us there like seeing a tiger on day 1 and unfortunately i could not record that as an adventure for myself because of my own ignorance so i decided that from now on i'm going to be a little more uh you know prudent that i'm going to learn a little more about flora fauna and you know what what happens out there till then for me it was it was just i just love being here it was not really about you know knowing things about finding out about names and all of that now while everybody went to bandipur to look at uh, tigers what really stayed with me you know from that uh, one week camp was butterflies i had never in my life seen this diversity of butterflies in fact to begin with when i was in the the wwf camp is when i learned first time in my life that butterflies had names yeah and uh, i mean you might find it very silly right now um but to me i had seen yellow butterflies and white butterflies when we walked to school and you know that was that um so the three day camp this was the other thing that kind of stuck with me and you know so one was anand and the other was the butterflies that oh my god uh, these people these things have names and when i came to bandipur i think we saw i i have my my field notes there but i, I didn't carry it here i'm i'm in another location right now i think some 82 if i'm not mistaken butterflies over a week and blew my mind it completely blew my mind and i knew that you know this is this is something that's you know got me at the you know i at a at a very very at my core and there's no escaping butterflies from then on in life well it also so happened that um, after the the trip to bandipur yeah um, i had a a small transition movement from bangalore from bombay to bangalore and um, i came to bangalore again in 2002 so i think the year 2002 has been quite a significant uh, for me from an adventure perspective and jumping from one thing to another and then to another and then to another and uh, i remember i was teaching french and then i decided to marry and move to bangalore and i was like okay what am i going to do with all my students so i i said i'll get married next year because my students have to complete their final exam next year and uh, one of my friends in at that point in time you know she happened to call me saying hey i'm planning to start teaching french can you give me some tips and you know can you guide me as to which tuition classes i can join and i'm like here here you go <laughs> i passed on all my students to her and i jumped on the next train and i came to bangalore and what you see there is a new is a is a is a new innings in my life with ozone ozone adventures uh, i joined ozone in 2003 Yeah, two thousand two end is when I came to Bangalore. I joined Ozone in two thousand three. Some of you who are into adventure may know Ozone as the organization which is into adventure sports in India. They brought bungee jumping to India, and many other things. Many many first. Yeah, Anand. May I jump in and tell you the shocking story of how I came to know about your marriage? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we were working together in. when you went for your bandipur camp correct and, uh, so priya and we were working so bandipur camp was was earlier earlier ha huh? yeah ha huh, much earlier but but priya uh, went went for a trip and she came back and then uh, yeah there was one trip in to bangalore in 2002 yeah huh? and yeah. and suddenly on the landline number only head, heads of departments in those days used to have the privilege of having a phone next to them i don't remember this ha huh? and uh, on the phone there was Karthik, her husband, and he's like, "Hi, Anand, how are you?" And Karthik had never called me. I knew him since my Doon school days, like you know, nineteen ninety four, ninety five or something. And then I was very surprised that Karthik is calling me out of it. And then he says, 
uh, is Priya there? I'd like to talk to her. I didn't even know that they knew each other. And I was like, okay, this is very odd. My friend calls me and now he wants to talk to a colleague of mine. So I was like, okay, Priya, a call for you. And she speaks. And then a few days later, we come to know that these guys are getting married. So, you know, it was like the whole two worlds kind of uh, coming together. But yeah. Yeah, I, I will, I will, there's this, we'll skip that, um, we'll skip on sharing that. that adventure piece. <laughs> yeah. That's, we'll keep it for another day. But yes, thank you. Anna. Yeah. And so with Ozone started a new adventure journey. Um, what stays with me is um, while a new adventure journey began, and this has happened for me time and again, and I want to share this with people who are really looking at, at this in their own lives. Um, so while, you know, Shikhar and I, that the trek had started and then WWF started and Shikhar kept going. And I moved to Bangalore. I started working with Ozone and WWF and Shikhar kept going in my life. Yeah, so what I also realized is that I'm able to find space in my life for adventures, which, which are core to me. There have also been other adventures which have been passing. You know, there have been interests that I have picked on and then done it for some time and then let go. And then there are, you know, certain things that kind of stayed with me. So this is one of those. Um, uh, like I said, Ozone was a was an adventure uh, organization in India. Uh, they used to also, um, I, I'm, I'm using the third person plural uh, because at that point in time, when I didn't know them, I'm coming from there. Yeah? And Ozone also made adventure gear. Ozone used to build tents. They were also trading in, in kayaks, rafts, you name it. And they were there. Um, they were one of the pioneers, I think, just before, just before Wildcraft kind of came in is, is what I remember. But yeah, they, they, they were around way before I came to Bangalore. Ozone, and I had honestly nothing to do with adventure, you see, so far, as in the hardcore adventure. So where did I fit in into Ozone? Now, my training with Mahesh Chaturvedi in the outbound corporate learning space is, is kind of what brought me to Ozone. And I joined Ozone in their corporate learning wing. And uh, we did a lot of uh, training, um, soft skills, call it soft skills, that's, that's the more familiar word. Um, what was exciting at Ozone and was an absolute delight and, and really an adventure for me was every program, every client that called us, every program, we customized and we used, we used even today, experiential learning as the basis for any uh, learning. And we were very happy to experiment, um, you know, just, just as, uh, uh, you know, any new product uh, is is experimentation is is one of the core requirements we kept experimenting and we i learned a lot uh, not just about the nature outside but i also started learning a lot about the nature within you know so um, for me it was work was working with people and natures and you know uh, inherent natures of people and when i would go outside it was about working in nature outside you know understanding uh, natural history and what was happening out there yeah suddenly i i got a call from mahesh one day uh, a few years down the line i was in bangalore and he said mujhe uh, apna birthday is saal everest base camp pe celebrate karna hai chalegi so, you know the answer to that question right so um the only thing is I, at that point in time, had no financial resources. And uh, typically to go on a good adventure, whatever the adventure is, not only do you need to be well prepared, you also need good sound financial backing. And somehow, um, you know, for me, neither of these have, have been true. However, the adventure still happened. So um, with the Everest Base Camp, um, I forgot what. Oh yeah, okay, just a, just an image. Sure. So so Everest Base Camp did happen, and it was one of the most amazing um, experiences of my life. Where the outdoor, you know, which is the trek and nature, kind of came together. Um, after every trek, of course, I went on treks even before uh, uh, the Everest Base Camp. I had done a lot of treks with Shikhar, you know, in all those years. 
Uh, but after every trek or after every travel that anybody from uh, from our friends group sprouts would go through it was customary to come together and do a slideshow which is which is what i mentioned right in the beginning that this slideshow has gotten postponed we we procrastinated it for a long time but nevertheless we are here so this slideshow was always typically the weekend following you know the trip that that somebody has completed and I remember sitting uh, at Anand's house and that's that's typically where all our slideshows have been, I think, so far. I remember sitting there and, uh, you know, showing our photographs and my sister Vidya and I, both of us had gone on the on the uh, EBC trek. And we shared all these photographs and then I said, huh, uh, you know, there were these, uh, these, um, what, what did I say? These uh, chicken poultry like things which were around us, you know, right at... Um, at Gorakshep and they were just all over the place and you know it was like like a duck with all the ducklings and they were going all around and Anand is like very okay so show us the photos and I'm like Asha, photos nahi liya, wo to bahut the. they were all over the place and everybody pounced on us and Anand was like are you guys crazy this is the Tibetan snowcock nobody has seen the snowcock you guys go all the way see this and don't even take a picture I mean you know, what are you guys so yeah so so these things, um, I think when one is not fully there, I mean, that's, that it's also an adventure in itself. We went to Everest Base Camp not knowing really what um, wildlife we would find there. Of course, we had a tryst with a Khalij pheasant. We saw the, um, um, the blood pheasant. So we had glimpses of all of these. And then when we opened the book and Anand was showing us, we're like, ha, isko yaha pe dekha tha, isko yaha pe dekha tha. Monal, we saw lots of them. And um, I think that's when we got a renewed interest in birds per se. Till then, for me, it was it was butterflies. Actually, even today, I'm a little biased to butterflies. Uh, I can't crane my neck and look up at birds, and, and I find it very uncomfortable. Um, but yes, I don't mind seeing the pheasants because they're all they're all ground dwellers. So most of them. So that that kind of did the trick. And um, soon enough, there was one. Soon enough, we had like-minded friends that we connected with. I connected with in Bangalore. And, uh, you know, by then a lot of people who were into nature and wildlife in their school and college and then had to kind of move away and get into corporate jobs because, you know, at the end of the day, roti, what is that? Papi pet ka sawal hai types, no? So everybody had gone, you know, into the corporate and... Um, I think after about 20 years, they were all slowly coming back, back together, saying, okay, can we do something? And uh, this uh, uh, educational institute, it's a nature-based nature, nature -based educational institute called EcoEdu Consulting. We kind of put it together. I'm a resource person on EcoEdu um, even today. And we've also published a few interesting books. Yeah, you can look up ecoedu.in and we have books on trees, um, creepers, spiders. We're coming out with a book on butterflies. Not that there are any lesser books on butterflies, but we decided that the, uh, you know, the a regional language book was a need of the hour. So that book is in Canada. Uh, so again, my life in Bombay kind of started mirroring because we started doing talks, walks with EcoEdu. And um, while all of this was happening, I visited, I happened to visit the, Bangalore. Um, some of you may know, how many of you visited the city? Bangalore? very well known for educational institutes. Yeah, so firsts in many, right? And um, like we have the IIT in Bombay and IIT in many other places and IIM in Ahmedabad, we have what is known as the IISC in Bangalore, the Indian Institute of Science, which has no branches. And um, there, are, there are also art organizing, art institutes, like we have JJ in Bombay. We have something here called the Chitrakala Parishad, CKB. And I remember uh, once when I went to CKP, there was an exhibition, photography exhibition. And um, I walked in and I expected to see frames. You know, you, typically if you walk into a, a gallery, you have frames put. And this was very different. I walked in and there were photographs on the walls from like from top to bottom. So it was like almost like plastered on the wall. And anywhere you turn, there were photographs. And this was a photographic, sorry, exhibition uh, on Antarctica. Yeah. And um, it completely, you know, almost consumed me because this large 
uh, you know, lifelike, life-sized um, portraits of of icebergs, you know, of of the ship itself at, at one point in time, completely mesmerized me. I mean, you know, and, and I remember thinking to myself at that time, wow, I would love to see these. And then it was just a fleeting, you know, thought intention. And then it, and then I kind of forgot about it um, for almost 10 years, I think. And uh, what, uh, what sometimes, you know, you put somewhere deep seated comes back to bite you. And um, uh, I won't go into a very long story as to how this happened, but yes, you know, almost 10 years later, 2011, um, I had an opportunity to go to Antarctica. And uh, this expedition was very special also because like I mentioned earlier, an adventure needs preparation, an adventure needs finance, also an adventure needs time. Time is always something that I have not had dearth of because I've I've pretty much um, uh, you know lived my life on my own terms in terms of managing my time. What I did not have was preparation and finance. And to do the Antarctic expedition, uh, this was conducted by an organization called Two Zero Four One, and you you see it there at the bottom, twenty forty one dot com. 2041.com is a not-for-profit. They were organizing expeditions to Antarctica once a year as a way, as a means of raising funds for their organization. What did the organization do? They were advocate, they were a, an, an advocacy organization. They were rooting for Antarctica. Rooting for Antarctica for what? Any idea? Any anybody has been to Antarctica or heard about anything about Antarctica? Yeah, Anand can answer. I'm sure we all have heard. Yeah, and uh, many times when we when we mute ourselves, it almost becomes a habit, and then we forget that we can also speak. But I'm going to let it pass in the interest of time. So she has she has written that uh, ice caps melting fast due to global warming. Yes, Shikha. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, also, while that is is an effect, you know, that is a uh, that is what what global warming will will land us up in. Antarctica itself is in huge danger. It's an endangered species. Okay, and the time bomb is already set, and it's ticking away. Right. So Antarctica is today the way it is it is the only or the last wilderness left on earth which is pristine and untouched by humans unexploited by humans yeah now the reason we humans have not yet uh, you know plundered antarctica for all its non renewable sources of energy yeah it has it's it's very very rich i won't go into details there again the only reason it is kept intact is because the countries have all come together and signed, signed a treaty. It's called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty expires in 2041. Okay, when the treaty was, was signed, maybe people thought it's a long time and, you know, doesn't matter, we'll, we'll pick it up when it comes. So for about 80 years, the treaty held. And 2041 is when it expires. And if we don't come together and renew the treaty, it is open for everybody. I mean, all of us sitting in this room are, are free to go to Antarctica and take whatever we want. There is nobody to stop us. They, Antarctica doesn't have a government. It yeah, doesn't belong to anybody either. So anybody who can go there can go. The only people who currently, according to the treaty, can, can be on Antarctica are people who are doing research and any, any peaceful purposes. You know, I think they also had some musical, if I'm not mistaken, sometime back. And um, uh, tourists are allowed to visit Antarctica under absolutely strict um, responsible tourism norms. And um, whichever country is taking tourists to Antarctica abides by it to the T. So 100% abide by, by the rules. And um, that's Antarctica. Uh, yeah, that's Antarctica for you. Now, 
2041 because it was advocating, you know, in COPs and in different forums to renew this treaty. It, it needed a lot of finance for its own survival. And uh, 2041 also keeps going and cleaning Antarctica of all the garbage that, you know, all our science, scientific stations just leave around. And uh, that also leads to the toxicity levels, at least in that area, going up. So for all that work, um, this is what, this is how they raise funds. So I was interested with the task of, uh, or I, I wasn't interested, but I, I, I jumped into, um, you know, it's like, I was, I was working, I was happy. I think it was a, yeah, it was a late January morning and, and Bangalore is, is cold in any case. And those days it was even colder and cooler. And I was nicely sitting in my office and, you know, I think having a cup of tea in the morning and my sister called me and she was chatting with me. We have this, this daily one call that we do. And um, she said, you know, there's somebody from my office going to Antarctica. And I'm like, how does that happen? Even I want to go to Antarctica. Right. And um, one thing led to another. It just so happened that the, the founder of this organization, his name is Sir Robert Swan. Uh, you may see him in, in a few minutes, if we are not running out of time, Anand will let me know. Um, so she said, yes, this is what is happening. And uh, Rob happened to be in Bombay at that point in time. She said, I can check with my friend and I can connect you, you know, to this organization. And a few minutes later, I was on the phone talking to Rob and um, Rob says, yeah, sure, you can come on. I mean, there, there's a lot of selection process. So he had a lot of chat with me also. But but what's more significant is, is that sure you can come. We leave um, Feb last week is when uh, you know the the expedition was to start, and uh, he said sure you can come along. Um, you need to raise uh, twenty five thousand US dollars to come on this expedition, and I said sure. So I was, you know, actually sometimes ignorance is bliss. I've been telling you about how not to be ignorant and how, you know, sometimes you miss out good experiences, but sometimes it's very good because um, I was like, sure, 25,000 US dollars, how doesn't, that's whatever it is, right? Because I had no clue what that was. Like I'm I'm not very savvy with with numbers and with, with money and it really worked to my advantage. Um, and I started saying, okay, so I have to collect 25,000 US dollars. I probably didn't know what the exchange rate was. I didn't, I didn't even know, even if I exchanged what that amount meant. And I had friends around me who were, who started getting concerned and they were like, do you even know what you're trying to do? It's just six weeks. How on earth are you going to get 25,000 US dollars? And I was like, I don't know, but I don't know how I'm going to get even thousand. So I, so it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know. So we'll figure it out. And um, that was not the biggest of my challenges. Uh, I had another challenge. I had to get a visa to South America. And uh, the even bigger challenge was that my passport had expired. So uh, I had these little, little things to be taken care of. But I told everybody, okay, February last week, I'm going to Antarctica. And... Uh, um, you know, I can write a book about those six weeks that went by. Um, the what what stays with me is one experience. Again, um, I would not call it short of any adventure because I had never done any fundraising, and I remember going to Titan, and I was quite quite nervous about asking people for funds. I didn't know how this thing worked. Why should I ask for funds? How do I do this? Why would anybody give me funds? And I had a friend who said, no, no, this is, you know, you should do it and this is what we can do. And then she came along with me. So I, I had a script in mind. I had written it down. I had rehearsed it. You know, I'm going to, um, you know, do, do a presentation after I come back. I'm going to take photographs with Titan banner and uh, some, something I had written. I don't, I don't remember what now. Because the experience I had at Titan kind of, I think, put all of that behind me. So I, I walked in and I kept waiting for the gentleman to, to come into the room. And he came in and he sat on the table. And I sat with my friend, you know, we looked at each other and she's like, talk to him, talk to him. And I'm like, yeah, so, you know, and I'm 
I, by now you know that I can I can speak English not bad. I mean, I, I can put sentences together. I can say what I want to say. I'm not bad. I went to a convent school. So I think my parents did, did something right there. So I told him all about why, you know, 2041 and why this is important and how I would bring them, you know, give them in return and, you know, why they should fund me and all of that. So I finished like one monologue and I was like, thank God I'm done. You know, now I'm, I'm ready to, for whatever he wants to say or ask me. And um, he said, you know, Priya, our advertisement budget is way, you know, beyond anybody any you can even imagine. And our reach is at least a thousand times the number that you're talking about in terms of reach. You know, we have newspaper ads, TV ads, all of that going for us. There's no reason for us to fund your trip at any cost. I mean, not the whole thing, but you know, I was asking for some parts, parts of it. Then there was this one boy who had walked in with him. I think he must have been a management trainee. So he turns, takes something from him and turns around and holds an envelope and hands me the envelope saying, we are giving this to you because we just want to support people like you who are willing to do this. I was quite speechless. I just didn't know what to say. Um, I managed a thank you. And um, he said, uh, we don't need anything. You can just take this and, you know, what you're doing is good. So keep it up. I think we ran out of there, both of us, and then slowly opened the envelope to see what was in the envelope. And... Um, uh, we had a very, very generous uh, contribution. And, um, you know, that almost, I didn't know that, you know, I, it was not that I didn't believe this would happen, but somewhere, even when you have faith, certain things happen in life to reinstill that faith, you know, kind of reinforces your faith in whatever it is that, that you, you know, are looking up to or maybe even just in yourself and um, just that trip to Titan and back was an adventure for me and after that I think everything was was just you know one after the other one after the other and and then, like I said that's that's a book for another day that's a that's an entire presentation for another day which I have done incidentally uh, because somebody said you always talk about the Antarctic uh, and you keep telling us that, you know, these six weeks were the most amazing adventure I've had. Why don't you talk about that? So I actually, you know, made a presentation on, uh, uh, yeah, just on those weeks. Uh, and, and it ended with, you know, I boarded the ship. So, <laughs> um, yes. So March, like you see here, I think I put the date there. One second, I got to go back to. Okay, the date is not here. Sure, right. So March 1st week, March 3rd was when the expedition began. I managed to collect all the funds. I managed to get my uh, passport in case somebody is wondering how I got there. I managed to get the passport. I managed to get a visa, managed to get tickets all through the generous generosity of different people, different organizations, um, friends, family, friends of friends, friends of families, families of friends. It was just unbelievable the the amount of um i don't i don't even know what to say because at one level one it was not a day of instagram and facebook and even though today it is there is instagram and facebook uh, i'm i'm not a very um, social media person but somehow i think people connect when there are you know like minded um, agendas like minded goals i don't even know how it happened in fact i i always wonder how our indian freedom struggle even happened without you know without all of this so i guess mine was a very yeah very very small thing so in six weeks yes i was ready the gear was ready everything was ready i will take you through that little piece of my life a little more i will zoom in so far it was like kind of zoomed out i will zoom into antarctica anand could you give me a time check yeah so six five p.m yeah. so i have 25 halfway. Halfway. yeah 30 halfway. minutes 30 minutes, yeah. 30 minutes, no? Yeah, yeah. okay. 35 okay, so is now, 
Okay. So now you will see me rushing through everything because... Uh, you take a sip of water and then... I have a lot of photographs to show you. So get your eyes ready for a visual treat. Yeah. And um, I'm going to share this piece of my journey to Antarctica. Um, starting with just how I went, though I, I, you know, I told you that I'm a Bombayite at heart. So I had to fly to Antarctica from Bombay. So I came to Bombay and um, South Africa, Johannesburg, and then to Argentina, Buenos Aires, and then to this place, little place here called Ushuaia. Okay. Now Ushuaia is the southernmost city in the world. Okay. And it is also one of the most beautiful cities that I have ever seen. In fact, I would vouch for it to be, I mean, if I had a chance to go back to that part of the world, I would spend two weeks in Ushuaia rather than spending my two weeks in Antarctica. Yeah, so this is Ushuaia. It's got hills and it has got lakes. It's got ports. It has got pretty much everything. Yeah. Now, after three days of acclimatization in Ushuaia, we boarded the ship. The ship was called the Sea Spirit. Yeah? As you see there, we had over 60 people from about 20 different countries. And our own country, we were a, a, a small contingent of about six people. That is Robert Swan there. And these are all my, my Indian friends. And um, the next thing we know, yeah, we are on board the ship. We are studying the route. And if you see this little map here, that's Antarctica. You may not have seen Antarctica huh? like this on the map because, you know, you'll have to turn your globe if you had a globe to see the whole of the whole Antarctica. In two weeks, what we visited was called the Antarctic Peninsula, which is just this little strip. It is huge. It's like really huge. And um, if anybody is interested... Yeah, I mean, this can always be sent. It's Everything is online. You don't need anything. But yeah, if some of you are interested, we started. Yeah, yeah. We started from here. Yeah. We started right from up there, but we came down here, Ushuaia. We went down like this, went up the Antarctic Peninsula, north, and then took this little turn and came back and went back this way. Yeah, visited King George Island. Some of you can read it there and then went back. Yeah. So while on the ship, sorry, I'll come back to this. Yeah. While on the ship, we were given an entire download of how this journey is going to be. It takes two days to go from Ushuaia across what is known as the Drake Passage. To reach Antarctica or to see the to start seeing the first islands of Antarctica. And um, the expedition had many leaders. We had incidentally, we had six expedition leaders all on our expedition. It just so happened that it was the last expedition of the year, and for some reason, all of them decided to join. Of course, we had one designated uh, captain, uh, the lead as well. So we got inputs from so many people and on so many different areas, you know, including geography, climate change, the natural history. It was it was quite quite a, a roller coaster three days, two, two days of uh, sessions continuously. And what was most dramatic about these two days and very, very experiential and an adventure to remember is crossing the Drake Passage. So the two days of crossing the Drake Passage were, uh, this is the Drake Passage, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's Ushuaia. Yeah, the South Shetland Islands are where we entered Antarctica from and this is the Drake Passage. Now the Drake Passage is known to be the roughest uh, you know water body in the world. Um, adventurous people in this room you can go to YouTube and say Drake Passage and you will see what it throws up. The at the mildest we had waves going up to third floor because the, the ship had floors right if some of you have been yeah on ships. Uh, we had, I think, five floors and, of course, all our cabins I and mean, the rooms are all covered and it's not like we are on, a, on an open yacht. It's, it's a ship, right? But um, at least two to three floors was what the waves would come up. We were advised strictly to either lie in bed completely 
uh, some of us who could, you know, who are, uh, I don't know, more acclimatized, braver, or were able to, you know, manage um, the pelagic journey. Um, we were taught how to walk on the ship for the two days. And um, there are different things you can do to, to avoid seasickness. There are pills, there are patches, you know, you can put a small patch here, like a little marble. And you can put, you know, like, like your scrunchy, like a rubber band, a hair band, and put a little marble, half a marble on it and put it. I mean, you get these contraptions. Or there are medical, chemical patches that you put. And uh, there are different ways in which you can avoid seasickness. Mm, but once you get seasick, there's not much you can do. So uh, we did have a lot of people who got seasick. And some of us who didn't. I was one of the fortunate ones. Um, two days of the Drake Passage kind of brought all of us close together. <laughs> Brought, brought 60, 60 people to, you know, it was a very easy team building, uh, putting all of us on the Drake Passage. Of course, we had three days prior to that at Ushuaia as well, but was a lovely, lovely group. Just a few tips, uh, not, not tips, amazing, like facts around Antarctica, and I want to share a few photographs, right? So you see the Antarctic pack ice covers 20 million square kilometers in winter. When is winter in Antarctica? Yeah, maximum in September, you see that? Right. So the, the summer months in Antarctica are December to Feb. Okay, and then slowly winter sets in. So in winter, that's the uh, area of the ice pack. And this is what happens in summer, right? 4 million square kilometers. So that's the island. Actually, that's the land. Okay. Priya, could you repeat? Show the earlier one and show yeah, the second yeah. so that okay. can get yeah. the So I'll go from here back to that. Yeah. So this is the actual size of Antarctica, land mass. Okay. And in winter, ice starts collecting on this and on the waters and it expands. So the, as, as, the, as the water freezes and you get more and more ice, you can literally walk on it. So it's, it's land almost it forms an area of 20 million square kilometers. So when you see it in winter, it looks this big, but really it's only this much. I mean, I'm saying only, but that's also quite, quite enormous. Yeah, we did a few things, fun adventure. We did the polar plunge where all of us, yeah, that's, that's me. I did it in spite of being from Bombay and in spite of wearing sweater in Bangalore every day. Okay, I can't get the pointer, doesn't matter. Yeah, there. Yeah. So we all did the polar plunge and uh, we did quite a few things. We hiked in, in various places. What you see behind me is, of course, our ship. And behind that is the other mountains. And we walked, we trekked. One day we went uh, trekking to quite a, a high point. And, um, and these were all islands. So, so every day we would keep going to different islands and... Uh, Parking there, the ship would kind of, you know, anchor itself. We would go out in small lifeboats and go to the island, spend the day, come back for lunch, have lunch, again go back. Uh, one day we also went camping, one night, two nights actually, we went camping. When you go camping, you take nothing with you other than your tents, which uh, of course the, the guides would take. Um, me and a few friends decided not to go into the tent and we created, you know, like a, a small barricade with the snow and we kind of slept in that. It was really, really fun. And um, yeah, yeah, that's what we did. Quite a few things, actually. Every day was an adventure in itself because you don't know what you're going to see. Uh, and what we saw, I will show you in a bit, right? But I just thought I would share something with you. So on our trip, the two-week um, expedition, at the end of it, we made a, we put together a small video. And I'm not going to share the whole video with you. It's a longish video, but I want to share a minute. Yeah, and uh, let me know if you can hear this. At the age of... Okay, that's our camping since it's there. I guess it's pushing me to... Yeah, are you able to hear this? 
Antarctica is more impressive than you'll ever really be able to imagine until you've seen it. There's nothing like it to see Antarctica. Here, there's that sense of being that's Robert in a Swan's place voice. That's bigger than we are, stronger than we are. But actually, it is very fragile. If you don't respect it, which I hope we do, um, it can turn against you and our fragility is also uh, highlighted. right now that apparently it's 300 meters deep in the water and it's actually stuck on the ground. Everybody's heard of global warming. Some of you have seen photos of the Larsen B ice shelf breaking off. We've all maybe heard of that story. Well, we're in it now. This is part of the Larsen B ice shelf that broke off and it shouldn't have broken off. And it's here, okay? So when you go home and people say, is global warming happening? At this second, you are inside the Larsen B ice shelf. Look, we're in it and it should not be here. Be responsible. At the age of 11, I... So I thought that was you know, a little relevant for us to see the ice shelf. And I am going to take you through a series of photographs. These are all photographs that, um, yeah, I think they're my pictures. You'll see the beautiful patterns because of erosion of the snow, of the rocks, of the ice. Yeah. And stunning white most cases, and in cases like this, with a with a little streak of sunlight, this was majority of the days. In fact, we had the sun only on I think one or two days, and you have these icy blue. When they say icy blue, I actually knew what what was the meaning of that word icy blue. That's icy blue, and if you see the below here, you'll see these patterns. I'll show them to you up close, and there were larger ones. Of course, you also have a a bird flying there, we will see that also. That's pretty much how all of us looked because we had to wear all our gear. Yeah, these are the icebergs, really life size. I mean, not not even life size, like larger than life. Yeah, again, highlight. Yeah, and ice flows. They were called as flows, smaller ice cubes, pieces that were lying around. You know, in the old freezers, we had the old fridge. In that freezer, you could collect the ice. Some of us. Who are from that yeah. it's that and this looks quite small here but really huge ones almost 20 30 40 feet right up in front of you because we are in the ship and then you're suddenly seeing this 40 foot ice flows on one of the days the we were on the uh, lifeboat and the the captain who was with us said let's go and get that ice you know it was sparkling you saw that diamond like thing right it was sparkling and we were all really curious so we went up to it and then when we collected it we realized what it was and they were carrying it back to the evening cocktail just quite a quite a thing beautiful patterns and literally you can go into them your life uh, life boat and crystal clear ice look at the pattern it's, I, it's almost like a sculpture yeah blue again for you. we also saw a lot of wildlife Mainly birds, of course, birds and seals. 
and I am going to sift through this absolutely stunning bird, the snowy sheath bill. The skua is what we saw earlier as well, flying. They're as, they're as common as house crows. These are the different penguins. We, of course, didn't see all of these. We saw the gen two, the adelie, chin strap. Yeah, that's what it looks like you know, there. That's the most common sight pretty much every day. Uh, I won't tell you how it smelled. We were told to take in nature through all your senses. And I wish, Anand, you hadn't told us that. Uh, yeah. These are the Gentoos. Really cute. Two and a half feet. All the way. This is chin strap. You can actually see the strap on the chin. Yeah. And they're all learning to swim in smaller puddles. And there was this beautiful interaction between the skua and these penguins. And seals, yeah, you may have seen them in zoos, fur seals, big ones, and per absolutely unperturbed, you know, the penguin just walks past, but not with these ones, okay? Yeah, this is a Weddell seal. And here comes the leopard seal. And uh, they're not best friends with penguins. These are the crab eater seals. And the marks you see on the crab eater seal, they also fight with each other. And I couldn't help but get a series of shots. I have put a very few pieces together, but just absolutely adorable. And then I think there's one more I couldn't keep away. Yeah, that's the one. It's my favorite. And... Uh, yeah, we saw whales, of course. Yeah, the humpback. Yeah. And so on and so forth was the, the two week, you know, two weeks in Antarctica. And um, yeah, we already spoke about all of this. Yeah. So Robert Swan, of course, was the first person to walk to the South Pole and the North Pole, which is why he was conferred the Order of the British Empire. Yeah. Lots of initiatives. We already discussed this. We have an e-base, as 2041, we have an e-base there where all the, in fact, when you go to the website, I think you will see the, the weather, yeah. And uh, that's that's all of us from all the countries. And theek hai, at the end of the expedition, you know, we said, ye sab toh theek hai, but abhi karna kya hai iska? You know, and I remember Robert called each one of us and um, spoke, had a conversation with each one of us over the last two days, saying, what are you going to do when you go back to your countries? And you know, everybody said we will switch off lights and we will switch off this, you know, we will not waste water and um, we will be more mindful. We will uh, save energy. And uh, I remember telling Robert, look, in our country, we all know, you know, what's good and what's not good. And India doesn't need me to go and preach, you know, saying, uh, you know, please do this, please do this, because we all understand. And we are also not a consumerist country. We come uh, and our legacy is amazing in terms of how we are so sustainable in how we manage things, even clothes. I'm sure, you know, even today, clothes are used by at least six people before, you know, and then it becomes maybe a duster or a, a rag, you know, and then something else and then something else. So our country doesn't need uh, any preaching around how to manage our lifestyles. Um, what can I do? And he said, you don't have to do that at all. Just tell people what you do. And your path will open for yourself. Each one has their own path. And uh, well, he was not very wrong because when I came back, I went straight to my, um, you know, to my friend and mentor uh, who is a, a theater, <clears throat> who's a, a mentor in, and has started uh, an English theater company in India, which is over 60 years old. And I was talking to him and I said, Vijay, Vijay Padki is his name. Uh, I told Vijay, ki, yaar, kuch karna chahiye. I want to do something. What do you think I should do? He walked in in his, you know, in his usual style. He said, give me a minute. He just walked in and within a minute he walked out. Oh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> I missed him. <laughs> I missed that. Yeah. And he walked in and walked out and gave me this book. Yeah. Vijay is an author. He's a playwright he's an actor himself on stage off stage and he's another person who has had a huge impact on my life and that Bangalore Little Theatre was another adventure that I have been on which I will not share over here um, 
And what we did over the next one year is bring this book alive. We put a musical together. We put a play together. This is a, a beautiful parable about change and managing change through the eyes of penguins, through a story, a parable of penguins and how they lived and what happened. And if you haven't read this book, please read this book. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's a small story book, actually. Everybody should read it. We also called Dr. John Cotter and, uh, you know, I did an interview with him. He was going to come for the really, for the launch, the first show, but he was unwell. But he sent across his videos, which we screened before the play every time. And that's, that's what happened uh, in Antarctica. Now, <laughs> I know the, the title said Tales from the Two Poles. So I can't end this talk without talking to you about the other pole. But I must tell you that, you know, these two poles were really poles apart, these two journeys. Yeah? So while Antarctica was absolutely planned and systematic and, you know, everything was in place, uh, we knew exactly what to wear, when, what not to wear. You know, we had a big checklist and it was, there was so much of planning that went into the Antarctic expedition. The Arctic Circle, um, I won't call it, yeah, it was an expedition actually. The Arctic Circle expedition, it was a very private expedition <laughs> with, with, with a few of us, um, was, was completely spontaneous. Yeah, I was... So Antarctica was 2011 and this was 2013 and I was at Bangalore airport and I was making a quick trip to the US. Uh, quick, quick, because uh, the trip was a long trip, but, but I didn't have too much time. I was busy. So I remember sitting at Bangalore airport and calling my friend saying, Acha, I'm going to the US you know, for a while. And one friend I called, uh, he said, Are, Acha, to US ja rahi hai. To Antarctica ja ke hai na. To Arctic circle bhi ja na. And I said, Aise thodi hota hai. I can't just go like that to Arctic, man. I'm, I'm going for all of this. And then I just kind of left it and I hung up. But you know that kida, no? So he had put that kida in. And then I sat there thinking, ha, kaise jata hai? And Arctic kya hota hai? Kaise hota hai? And um, fortunately for me, it was also matching some US timing. So I called a friend in the US and I said, hey, how does one go to Arctic? Because I knew he's the most traveled within the US. How does one go to the Arctic? You know, I'm just checking him. And he said, oh, you want to go to Arctic? I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's possible because I'm going to the US and Arctic is in Alaska, right? I mean, I was, I'm also poor in geography apart from other things. Okay, so uh, I said, Arctic is in Alaska. Now I'm going to US. He was like, um, and I, I knew this much that I had to cross Canada. I mean, Alaska is like right up there. That much, some vague geography, I mean. So he said, ha, to kya hua? you have a US visa, no? Hey, but if you really want to go, friends of mine, three of my friends from different states in the US are planning on a road trip to Antarctica, uh, sorry, to the Arctic Circle. And do you want to join them? And the dates he gave me were absolutely overlapping with eight days or nine days of, of open gap I had between my work schedules and I was to meet a friend in Dallas. And I said, perfectly works. So uh, he said, okay, I'll connect you to them. And we did all of that over WhatsApp. And of course, those people, I think, had gone to bed. So it took a few days for these things to fall in place. But yeah, I landed in San Francisco. I had no clothing. I had no gear, absolutely nothing. And my cousin said, uh, and I was flying in and out of San Francisco. So my cousin said, after you finish all this work, why don't you borrow clothes from us? Mm, and I was like, in the US, everything is expensive. I can't carry two bags, right? I mean, some of you who've traveled would know. Um, it's very, very difficult to, to carry baggage in the US. And then I remembered that the my Dallas friend was my size. And I did have some work as well in Dallas. So I called her and I said, just, you know, I'm going to just raid your wardrobe. And I picked only clothes for, for Arctic from my cousin's place, filled my bag with it, my suitcase. And, you know, just raided my friend's walk-in wardrobe. That was a cool part in the US. She had a walk-in wardrobe. I was so thrilled. And um, went to the Arctic uh, on the Dalton Highway. Now, the Arctic Circle, right? Um, you can enter across the Arctic Circle through different countries. How many of you have been across the Arctic Circle? Anybody here? Nobody here? But it's very easy to go to cross the Arctic Circle, okay? Because you can go to any country and just go across, cut the circle. Um, we went uh, to Alaska, so the Dalton Highway. 
uh, is where is what leads you. It's quite a treacherous highway, and we were in winter, so there was snow and sleet. So that was the other uh, piece to the whole thing, and it was fun driving on the sleet. I mean, it was risky as well, but that's the uh, there was a little bit of a, an adrenaline there. And um, apart from birds here and there, uh, what to me was the most amazing sight, because it was just snow and snow and snow and nothing else. You know, trees covered with snow and highway with snow. But this this thing like really takes the cake for me. I had heard of Santa Claus and I had heard of reindeer and seen one reindeer, you know, in photographs with Santa Claus's sledge. But this is a sight that I had never seen or not even expected to see. And um, there were that many caribou. Uh, and, uh, we were, we paused. I mean, they, was, they were just there. They were just grazing. And some of them were moving around, running around. And... Um, we didn't want to go close to them. We also didn't want to get off the highway because there were vehicles that would come. It was also not a very uh, smooth drive, so to say. Uh, but this really, really, you know, took the cake for me. Yeah. And yes, we did manage to to reach the Arctic Circle. Um, the Arctic Circle journey. Um, uh, maybe another day, I will share my my story of, of how we I got to the Arctic Circle. But yes, it was completely unplanned. Um, again, shoestring budget, actually no budget. I think I had some $100 or $120. But because we were, four, they were very happy. These three people are very happy to have me because then there were four people in the car and one more driver and everybody could share expenses. So it worked for them. It worked for me. Of course, I went four days earlier and I spent some time in Palmer. Um, and Fairbanks and then Palmer. So that's that's another adventure I had. I had no bookings, I had nothing. I had I had one booking and this lady on the flight who met me said, that's absolutely not a place you can go. It's very risky. And um, we were to land at midnight and she said, look, uh, my friend is coming to pick me up and what we'll do is we will drop you to that, um, whatever I had booked, you know, one, one inn. And by the time we landed, the flight was delayed. By the time we landed, I think it was 1.32. And um, she said, there is absolutely no way you're going to go there. Um, I said, no, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. You know how we are, right? No, no, I'll be fine. If you can drop me, that'll be great. And we went round and round the block. And then we saw police there. And, you know, there was some not, not a great uh, area to hang out. And she was right about it. And her friend said, uh, they, they both spoke to each other. They were in the front seat and I don't know what they spoke to each other. And then they turned to me and they said, look, we know you've come from India and you know we know that this is a very new place for you. Uh, but uh, if you think this is okay and if we can, you know, we would like to uh, suggest that you come with us to our place and we will drop you back in the morning because that is the best thing to do right now. And I was like, cool. So both these women were about 65, 68. They were school friends. One lady had lost her husband and the other friend had come to meet her from San Francisco. So I went to their house and the most uh, uh, amazing, uh, I don't know, experience I had with them, they were so warm uh, in spite of, you know, them being in, in grieving mode. I think I was, I was also a distraction for them because we kept chatting through the night till the morning, till seven o'clock we were chatting. And they wanted to know all about India and in those three. And then I never went back incidentally because we just enjoyed each other's company. And I had told them, I want to see the polar bear. And um, uh, they said, sure, or something like that. And I, I was, again, no, ignorance is bliss. So I had no idea. And after I went there and I started looking up, I realized that you don't see polar bears like, you know, you have to go on an expedition to see a polar bear. And it's it's a very different ball game. And the next morning, these ladies got me into the car and they drove off and uh, we went to uh, Fairbanks and they said, uh, they took me to a lot of different places and the zoo and all of that. And then they brought me to this place and they said, you wanted to see the polar bear. We couldn't let you go without showing you a polar bear. So I saw two lovely, huge polar bears. I'll bet they were in the zoo. It didn't matter. What mattered to me was the warmth of these two women, uh, you know far, far away from, from where I was. Um, and, uh, and actually that adventure had just begun because that, that trip, that eight day trip was, was another, um, another thing completely. So 
these friends came and picked me up. I, I met them somewhere midway, the other three people who were coming to Alaska um, and to cross the Arctic. And I met with them and then we went on the Dalton Highway. So I'm doing a little rewind here because I, I just thought, you know, this was important to share how people show up, you know, and how um, friends, you know, show up suddenly, you know, it was almost like we were long lost friends. And because the next day they called two more friends of theirs and we had like one women's circle left. It was really nice. And uh, of course, then Dalton, Dalton, across Dalton Highway to Arctic Circle and back, back to Dallas, back to San Francisco. And I came back to India. Now, this is the most important part. And I know I've run out of time, Anand. Give me a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, okay, this is a quick quiz for everybody here, whoever. So you have to wake up now. Quick quiz. You can unmute and answer or you can type your answers in the chat. No, no, unmute and answer. Please unmute everybody. Oops. Yeah. Oops. I gave that thing away. <laughs> I couldn't see my, my banner. Yeah, Arctic and Antarctic. Who's going to tell me the differences? Just shoot quickly. Only Anand is mute. Everybody else is fair play. Please unmute yourself and... Uh, come on, come on. Uh, yeah. Differences between the Arctic and Antarctic. We've done this in school, no? Compare and contrast. Yeah, that's enough. The difference in hemispheres. A little Sorry? louder, please. Difference in hemispheres. Uh, yeah. Different hemispheres, yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is north and which is south? Arctic is north. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And we have the polar bears and Antarctic. We have the. Yeah. Shikha wrote penguins. that Antarctic has penguins and Arctic has polar bears. Yeah. Is anybody else going? So one said north. Come on. So Arctic is northern hemisphere, Antarctic is southern hemisphere. Yes. Yes. That's the other one. Uh -huh. Okay. Antarctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. Sorry, Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, while Antarctica is a continent in itself. It is surrounded by the ocean. In the Arctic, you have many terrestrial animals. In Antarctica, none. Arctic, lots of different people, indigenous people, very, very deep cultural history, absolutely no record of humans ever. The um, average thickness of ice pack is 10 to 20 feet in Arctic. And in Antarctica, any guesses? Yeah. 7,000 7, wow. feet yeah, is the average thickness. Yeah. Natural resources are commercially exploited. Natural resources are not commercially exploited. And I added the yet, and I hope I will erase. I need. I can erase that, that yet very soon. Okay, so, so yeah, that's... I clarify about the no terrestrial mammals, that these are largely amphibious mammals. Go ahead, Anand, go ahead. Yeah, so like you saw the seals, etc. They are not terrestrial mammals. They go, they live largely in water. Whales and seals and other things that you saw, they are not, not terrestrial, whereas bears, etc. are terrestrial. They do, bears do swim, but they are largely terrestrial and they go to the water. And the other way, it's true for the seals. For the seals. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then coming back to real life, you know, all the learnings that I've had through Shikhar, you know, Sprouts, WWF, looking at, um, you know, my experiences in Antarctica and a little bit of adventure in the Arctic. What I realized is that natural history is everywhere, right? Oops, sorry. <laughs> there is natural history everywhere and all of us are passionate about natural history. But somehow I realized that while in other countries, being a naturalist is a very, very viable and honorable profession. In India, the word was not even known, not even recognized by the government. And so to cut the very long story short, uh, this is a this story started late 2019. Um, but what we have today um, is I worked with the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, and we've put in place courses into mainstream uh, in the mainstream for a nature guide and that of a naturalist yeah. and then the ministry said Achha, ye course to institute ho gaya, abhi karega kaun isko? so then you know we founded this organization called the naturalist school 
again late 2021 2021 is when we got we founded naturally school is a foundation a section 8 company we are not for profit and what we have done so far um, i will tell you in a minute because this is an important quote that you may all be familiar with and um, we go with the motto learning is in our nature and here are some highlights of what we have done just a, a, a few seconds we've worked in about 15 states we work with communities with youth in and around forest areas, capacity building them to become nature guides. We collaborate with forest department and the local NGOs and create livelihood opportunities for them. Um, we also work with citizens. We conduct what is a citizen naturalist course. And a lot of it has been borrowed, learned from WWF, from Sprout. So, you know, gratitude to everybody. We're just trying to bring everybody together and um, find a way to collaborate or, or create a collaborative space for all organizations, all experts in India so that we can work together and bring this into the mainstream. And I keep saying mainstream, that's because there was no accredited course in India so far. You know, it was all in the informal sector, gray market. <laughs> but now, now we are standardizing it so that, you know, it's also it also helps us from a global standpoint because internationally, then there is recognition and we are able to also collaborate, you know, with other universities and all of that. Um, yeah, up footprint so far, uh, we work with, uh, we do a lot of citizen engagement. Our uh, volunteers, we are, we're primarily volunteer led. Our volunteers work <clears throat> with youth, with, uh, yeah, we do a lot of urban city walks, talks, all of that. Um, we have conducted certified nature guide courses in, since 2022. And today, as I speak to you, we are running India's first certified naturalist course, which is a 750 hour course. It's just begun. Uh, it'll get over August 31st, 2024. That will be landmark day uh, for a lot of us because we will have um, naturalists that are actually recognized by the I think Priya's computer uh, charging probably got affected. But I hope y'all are not out of breath uh, while listening to such a fantastic uh, talk. Yeah, she's back here. I'll, I'll admit her. Yeah, I'm back. I'm, yeah. yeah. So that was almost the end of the, the slides. And I think my laptop decided to decided to run off, which is which is also fine. And um, what I would like to, uh, you know, kind of. So, yeah, so we are. This is where we are. You can find us on the naturalist school on Instagram. Uh, you can look at um, naturalist dot school. Uh, that's our website. Yeah. And um, I want to, you know, end this um, um, lecture, like somebody says, is you know, by a, by a small couplet that you might have heard before. So Gote once said that, you know, if ever you dream, okay, of something, or even that you, you dream that you can do it, okay, if ever you have a dream or you dream that you have something that and that you want to do it, just begin it. He said, just begin it because boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. So I urge all of you to, um, you know, go out there and uh, whatever adventures you have had so far, cherish those, pick up those learnings and go on new adventures starting today. And yeah, and, and let's, let's meet somewhere sometime on some journey. Thank you. That was simply amazing, Priya. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, the women are on top of the world, right? Would you agree, Priya? Well, having been to Antarctica, I don't know which is top and bottom. I mean, uh, I <laughs> no, but my, what I, I mean to say, that. what I mean to say is that uh, Priya has shown us that uh, you know uh, women can travel around the world. Uh, they, they uh, of course, you have to be adventurous. You have to, you know, uh, take that bold step of wanting to step out and train and prepare and plan. I'm sure there's a lot of paddling that happens under the un seemingly unruffled feathers on top. <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't happen uh, much. Like but it yeah. happened for this talk. 
right it happened before this talk i'm sure <laughs> so yeah if there are questions you can unmute yourself and ask uh, you want to take a sip of water chai priya i'm good, I'm good. i had everything oh, right. hot water okay. cold water chai i have amazing friends great <laughs> chalo so uh, yeah anybody who wants to uh, shoot questions or uh, comments of course brilliant journey lot of learning uh, yeah, a lot, some people said Jaydev said that was so lovely to hear from you, Priya. Felt like trip to the pole. Looking forward to more such interactions. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime any of you are in Bangalore, ping. Yeah. Priya, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. Unmute yourself and you can ask directly. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have no such questions, but I really want to say a big thank you to you to share your experience with all of us to take out your time and do so. It just felt like a short trip to the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic. And it is like one thing that I take from the lecture is that if you have the will to do something, things will fall in place. Absolutely. Like the, as the finance that you said or the preparations you said, it is just like a learning that I've taken from this uh, lecture. So thank you for uh, motivating all of us. And uh, hope to attend more such lectures with you in the future. Thank Any you so time? much. Yeah, and the one more thing you need to do to get on the adventure is to drop the ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> that will take your places, trust me. And you've also set an example for a lot of women who think that they are not capable of doing something or they are uh, afraid of taking mm -hmm. the steps. So it's, it's a big yeah, example. That, that's possible. I don't think any woman thinks it's not possible or she can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um. Some, yeah. Some but yeah, but but taking the step is is a different. Yeah. yeah. So, so, thank you so much. I have seen um, men equally backing off, so I I somehow yeah, mm, yeah uh, don't really put so much importance on the gender. Uh, I think mm -hmm. individually, internally, if you want to do something and if you are willing to. Um, you know, normalize, equalize with people, talk to people. Everybody is there to help you. So Priya, there is a question by Yana. Is there a reason for picking out that specific route plan for the journey in Antarctica? Yes, but for that, if you want to know why, I'll have to go back to the organizers from from 2041 and ask why. Because oh. yeah, we were just yeah, it was just handed to us. It's not like we were part of any decision making process. But but in the sense is the, is that because you get to see some of the most significant yeah, yeah. so I can yeah I can respond to it in a yeah so um it's it's difficult to access um deeper parts of Antarctica it costs more it takes more time it takes more energy ship all of that number one number two um we wanted to cross the Antarctic Circle so we had to go till where we did to cross the Antarctic Circle we also wanted to visit the scientific research stations we visited bellingshausen king george island so we so there were there were reasons why we had to touch different points and therefore then the route was was drawn based on all of that and we also try and time it when the drake passage is less fierce so we were lucky we we got an a safe passage in and out I believe uh, people have to also be sedated sometimes, you know, if the if they feel a lot of uh, like seasickness as well as other things. Uh, have to be sedated. I don't know, but they will vomit. So if you don't want them to vomit, I think then that's when you sedate them. I don't know. We didn't. We didn't. That wasn't an option on the on the ship. Hey, somebody I know who had gone. He said that. Uh, yeah, he had been sedated for a bit. Right. So Ranjit is asking a very interesting question. Is it is it very silent there? <laughs> yes. Yes. And like I told you, that silence is something that you learn to appreciate. And I learned to appreciate when I was, uh, you know, inside the National Park for the first time. You actually hear the silence. I mean, I actually heard the silence only when I was coming out of it. No, but specifically in Antarctica yes. or or right. uh, let's say Black Peak, Shitidhar, uh, Everest Base Camp. You know, to be very practical, I mean, while it's very nice and romantic 
thought what also happens is there are people you are with most of the time i was with people i didn't do a solo expedition yeah. so there isn't silence in that sense because people around me are talking and i am talking so um but yes at a at another level yeah there is a lot of peace there is a lot of silence in antarctica we we all trekked up a particular island like most of the time we visited islands but once we went to mainland antarctica which means you, we were actually at the lowermost tip of the world and there we trekked up and we sat on nico uh, harbor nico island and we all took half an hour out just we just sat in in separate places you know away from each other and we just you know stayed with ourselves for that half an hour and that yes there was silence yes yeah now please go um, ahead thank you so much for taking out your time and telling us about your journey and i really wanted to point out that the fact that you started with sanjay gandhi national park i live away 15 minutes from there and i am someone who has wanted to go on treks but i'm just too scared and this actually kind of pushes me to actually go and explore and start maybe at just sjnp for the beginning and eventually maybe even go on my own expectations absolutely and it's good thing fear is a very good thing because then then you can work through it right because then when there is fear you know that there is something that's bothering and you want to do something about it so then there is restlessness so then you will go and find you know avenues to do that so yeah yeah all the best you have been to kaneri right yeah you have tried yeah kaneri yeah yeah riya please go ahead uh so i have a question it is like you said it is silent in the arctic circle and the antarctica also so how it was after you came back from the trip were you able to digest that oh i saw the antarctic uh, the arctic circle in antarctica so it is very funny because um, for me it was you know i went to shitidhar i went to everest i went wherever i mean i just went to antarctica it all happened and and i was busy in antarctica and i was just happy to go and come back but when i came back life kind of changed a little bit um because uh, suddenly people were taking note they wanted me to come and talk they wanted me to have like lots of talks and um i was in newspapers and everywhere and um that uh, you know kind of shifted something for me and that's when i mean i won't say that's why but that also happened in parallel to me um you know trying to spread this message about antarctica and um, till then i was a very very um i was i was a person who was living just for myself and i think coming back from antarctica and what i received from the outside world kind of almost drew me into you know the uh, into society so to say i mean i'm for lack of a better word right now and um, i think from that that point on to where i am today uh, i think that might have kind of triggered this work that i'm doing currently because i used to hold the uh, you know this this belief that i'm very selfish you know i will do what i want to do i'm not uh, you know nobody Uh, ask me for anything nobody should have any expectations of me and i don't want to have any expectations of anybody but um, but with all these things that have happened in life i think the naturalist school has been uh, yeah has been a, a, a baby that um, i have had to nurture for three years so far we'll be turning three and uh, not just myself so that's the other thing right i don't have children um, incidentally and um, well not incidentally by design uh because i didn't believe that i was you know competent enough to raise children and that's not a responsibility i felt i could shoulder but you know universe proved me wrong because naturalist school happened and uh, there yeah, have been so 20 people who have come together to to raise it and i have not been alone like they say it takes a village to raise a child naturalist school is truly a product of of an entire village and more nationally and internationally and yes my volunteers had asked me to say this and i'd almost forgotten so please um please follow us on um instagram facebook linkedin and twitter and please like share comment 
<laughs> follow us and please help us with with funds when you can where you can if you think there are we are eligible for csr funds from this year on um yes yes lovely it will be happy to to work with all of you So yeah, Ramnath, uh, Tejas, Antra, Virubhai, Anna, Shik Shikha, Darshana, any questions, uh, comments? Not a question really, but just, just reminding Ria yeah, and Yana. Yeah, Antra, go ahead, please. Yana, I think you said that you stay 15 minutes from uh, yeah. Gandhi National Park, right? So just remember that Kalpana Chavla, the girl from Karnal, and where she reached. Yes. She started yes. off in the flying school in Karnal, and then she made it all the way to NASA. So it's very small journeys that seemingly seem to be so tiny, and it's just when you take the steps, the like step. we also mentioned, and yeah. where you where it takes you. Completely agree. Take the first easiest step every time. That's all. But but like I would say, Priya will also agree with me. Adventure sports is not about being foolish. You know, safety and uh, like the safety rope has always got to be there. You will never step into an unsafe. Uh, that's not adventure. That's foolishness. So, so like Priya, uh, again, another trait that she has that she befriends people like this on a flight or a bus, you'll find them, she becomes a part of the family and they accept her. With, and that is a, you know, letting yourself become somebody else's friend or companion. I think that is also something that you should know that she so easily gels into and melts into people's lives and families that allowing yourself to be part of a, a journey or a, or a process uh, you know, if you are rigid and if you have your limitations about things, but, uh, Priya, you are a vegetarian, you are, you know, so you do have your, you know, what, what you will do and what you will not do and what you will have, what you will not have. But yet you manage to express and, you know, go reach these two poles, the ends of the world as one can call it, right? So I think uh, that is also a lesson that we should all uh, take from this that, yeah, we all, you have, a family, you have a mother-in-law, you have your parents, you have all these and, and the societal boundaries that are there. But within that, what she, I think one yeah, takeaway should be that, yeah, don't stop dreaming, don't stop wishing that what you want to do. And the world, as they say, you know, the bucket list, like put it out and the world will make it happen in a way. Right? So I think Absolutely. that's, that's uh, kind of highlights it out <laughs> in that manner. And, and safety, not just physical, but also psychological safety, you know, and emotional safety. So I think that's also something while we expect for a place to be safe, can I first find it in myself? Can I offer it to other people? And automatically it will also come to me. Yeah, Riha, you have you raised your hand. Go ahead. I'm glad you're feeling excited enough to ask questions. Go ahead, Riha. I am excited to ask questions because I'm very in inspired right now after listening to her story and her travel story. Um, one thing I want to ask you, uh, maybe it's like a personal question or so, but uh, as we've seen it in our geography book, the Arctic Circle, the Antarctic Circle, the Antarctica and everything. So what was your first reaction when you saw that place? The? When I saw the? The place, like the first reaction. The place? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I don't even know how I can tell you. So we just stood there on the ship and the first time we entered the island right in front of us, you know, it's like so huge, the iceberg. Uh, you know, you when you, when you do these things, when you go on these extremes, you really learn the meanings of, of different words. Like I said, I see blue is something I learned. I also learned what it meant to be speechless. You know, so yeah, meanings of certain words can't be just learned cognitively. It's it's very experiential. So yeah, I can I can only say that. In fact, people have asked me, was it cold in Antarctica? And I was like, yes. <laughs> it was as, as cold as cold can be. 
So how, Priya, how cold was it? What was the temperatures in both the places? Doesn't matter. Actually, that's what happened to me because I'm very, very. Uh, I'm not a. I don't like cold too much. I'm a. I'm a very, very warm-hearted Bombayite. And um, when they said polar plunge, and people were all saying, "Oh my God, it's going to be this much degrees, so and so degrees." And honestly, again, to me, it didn't matter at all because I was afraid of cold anyway. I mean, I can't even have a cold water bath, so. I didn't even think about what temperature because I mean I'm I'm any phase, you know scared, <laughs> so it, it's sometimes easy you know when you're ignorant because then you don't know what you can't do, and if you just put your mind to it, I mean at least for me in my case then I just I'm like okay whatever I'm just going it doesn't matter. I know it's going to be cold I know it but but one thing is like Anand said, I trust the system that I'm not going to die I'm not going to freeze. Right, because I trust the system that I'm with. I know that the crew is there, and I just need to put my trust in them. So I first need to have faith in myself, in my safety, physical and 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 you know psychological, and then place the safety in the system. And once that is done, once the trust is established, then then it doesn't matter whether you're either bungee jumping or you're you know doing a polar plunge or whatever it is. But be careful. Be careful before you trust a system. You need to do your homework well. You need to get you know, acclimatized. You need to get references, feedback. And with this world of um, digital uh, everything, um, I think sometimes we are, uh, you know, we are, we are losing significance of real people and the real world. And I think uh, it's, it's helpful to hold on to it. At least I believe... Uh, for me, it's been helpful to hold on to real people. So if the others don't have any questions, I have a question for you, Priya. Okay, I thought you're going to say, okay, we are going to close because it's seven o'clock and nobody has a question. I'm in so, time. So yeah, okay. before before that, you know, uh, is it, do you have, uh, shall I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, since there are parents in this audience, I know of, uh, what is the age that you would say that uh, when should they start their child's journey into adventure sports or into nature adventure in your since you have so much experience in the field yeah yeah sure sure in fact we also take children out so um so one is it depends on what adventure but one thing that i would say in fact just yesterday we were talking about this and we said every child you know will benefit with the uh, exposure of going on a camp, on a trek, on a camp on their own, not for like one day, but like a seven day minimum, you know, five day, seven day, 15 day and trust the system that they will not die. You know, they will come back, whatever they are going through, allow, you know, can I allow myself, you know, that, that allowance to let the child experience really. Um, again, when you're talking about age, we take children, when I say we, Shikhar takes children nine years and above on high altitude treks. And we've been doing this for like 40, 50 years now. Um, nature camps, the youngest person at our nature camp, I think was three years old once. Um, so as long as the child is with you on a nature camp, great. As soon as you have somebody who's announcing a camp, be it Sprouts, be it any organization that you trust, whatever age they demarcate, you know, just trust, trust them. If you trust the person there, trust them and send, send children. And that will be, uh, you know, such a big service to children. So I think see. as long as they can brush and they can, you know, do their, uh, do their job. I think they're good. You should just send them. So, yeah, uh, to kind of, you know, let, uh, share with you, uh, we had Vikram's son who was two years and seven months with Vikram and Mahima with us. And we went and climbed uh, to Gochella uh, and we created a world record with the youngest person uh, to co go to such a, you know, cross 15,000 feet. Uh, but this kid had started camping with us when he was nine months old. We used to carry a tent with us and the kid used to be, you know, with us. So it's up to the parents. If the parents are there with them, of course, what Priya is saying is that, you know, handhold and take them with you for a certain period of time. And then when they're ready, you know, uh, let them 
go for it. Don't like the first camp, send them for five days or seven days unexposed completely. That might be traumatic or, you know, but if, if they come with you for a certain number of time, they're comfortable with those things, with the same groups again, if for a certain period of time, like we've had so many kids, you know, uh, who've started very early with us. And then when they are even seven, eight years old, I think if uh, Surujan would have joined, he would have told you that he started when he was about uh, nine years, eight, nine years. And then by, by the time he was 11, 11 and a half, his parents used to come and drop him at the bus stop or station. And they used to come, he used to come with us and then he used to go back alone. And now he's about 15, 17 or 18 years old. And, you know, so definitely uh, these experiences can be uh, explored further by parents. So yeah, it's 9-6. I'd hand it over to Yana to do the official uh, closing for the evening. Priya, you want some last closing message? No, uh, oh, no I have I have spoken enough and more. And um, um, we have one more talk. I have to attend a talk for today on, on uh, uh, Ocean Day. So it's called a dialogue on exploring our oceans, which is at 7.30. And I'm, I'm quite close. So I'm, yes. I'll and rush, rush there. Excited. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming and listening in. And, you know, it'll be lovely to hear your stories, you know, whenever Sprouts announces. We will. We will. Definitely. So over to you, Yana. Thank you so much for taking all our questions and answering with so much enthu. And uh, today I would like to say that we learned a lot. Usually it just feels like oh arctic circle polar bear something like that but today it was like watching happy feet really happen in real time it was truly truly inspirational and really enjoyed the talk thank you so much for taking out the time and thank you so much for all the work you're doing can't wait to be a part of that as well and since now i'm at sprouts i can't wait to go on some more nature walks and treks with Aaron. so thank you so much enjoy all right guys bye have a good evening Happy World Ocean Day to everybody. Bye. And Happy World Ocean Have a Ocean. good weekend also. Stay yes. safe and keep experiencing adventure. Thanks, Priya. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Take Thank care. You. Good night. Bye. Good night.